So um, I'm going to tell you about some uh, recent results, recent and less recent results with uh, Elliot Lieb and uh, Robert Seringer from Vienna. Uh, please do not uh, hesitate to interrupt me at any time, but uh, then speak loud because it's very hard for, for us here on Zoom to, to understand your questions. So maybe you, you, have to, you have to stand up and really uh, speak loud, but really do not hesitate. I will be happy to take any question. So uh, here is a list of references uh, concerning the works we've done in the past, uh, I don't know, like five uh, or a little bit, uh, say five years. I've put this list just because the, the, the PDF is gonna be online. So in case you are interested, then you can just take a look at the papers. Otherwise we will start with uh, the usual uh, Schrodinger equation for N electrons. So we consider n electrons in an external uh, potential V, and V is going to be quite arbitrary. So V is uh, here any external potential. However, we look at n electrons, so we've ha we have the usual Laplacian. I've not put uh, the, the usual one half uh, here, so if you like, uh, we work in uh, units where the mass is, uh, is uh, uh, one half. And here is the usual uh, Coulomb repulsion between the electrons. The psi, of course, has to be anti-symmetric. And here is the eigenvalue. In the talk, I'm only going to discuss ground states. So En of V will thus denote the lowest eigenvalue, or if you like, the bottom of the spectrum of this n-body uh, operator. Of course, in uh, the, the anti-symmetric subspace, because electrons are fermions. I will also put spin. Spin does not appear here in the equation, but it's there, it's hidden in the variables for psi. So here is the definition of E and of V. It's the infimum of the spectrum of this operator here for fermions. And uh, let me remind you that uh, by the variational principle, you can get the infimum of the spectrum by minimizing uh, the corresponding energy, if you like. But you can also use mixed states if you, if you wish you get the same answer. So a mixed state is just a, an average of, of pure states, a convex average of pure states, if you like. So it's this big N particle density matrix, uh, capital gamma, which has trace one. And then I take the trace of the Hamiltonian against gamma. I'm always gonna discuss mixed states here for simplicity, just to make a choice. So you very well know that uh, Schrodinger's equation is a really a beautiful equation and it just takes uh, one line here and it's supposed to describe many different systems where electrons occur like uh, small molecules up to micromolecules or even bigger materials. Of course, it's all uh, just a dream because in many cases, it's extremely hard to solve this equation to a sufficiently high precision. And therefore we have to do some approximations in order to get some ideas of how these electrons are behaving. So my talk is going to be about uh, DFT, so density functional theory, uh, where we base uh, all our analysis on the density. But uh, what is the, the general spirit of, uh, of uh, density functional theory, at least the way I will present it in my talk, is it's that instead of studying this uh, En of V, you see this I can see as a functional of the potential, the external potential. Okay, so to any external potential, I can compute the ground state energy. I'm going to look at the Legendre transform of uh, this uh, function. Okay, so I'm gonna change my variable and I'm gonna use the dual variable to the potential, which is the density. Okay, that's the main spirit of uh, DFT in this variational formulation. So the variational formulation, or if you like the convex uh, formulation of uh, DFT, it's, it's not the only uh, formulation, but that's the one I'm gonna use in this talk, is due to uh, Elliot Lieb in uh, 83. And it's based on the fact that EN of V is a concave function of the potential. This was actually mentioned by Maria today in her talk. Maybe I'll show again the definition of EN of V, you see, you are minimizing linear functions of V because for any fixed uh, mixed state gamma, then it's just linear. And then if you minimize linear functions, then you always get a concave 
function. So this here is a concave function of V, and therefore it makes sense to uh, parameterize it uh, by its uh, Legendre transform, which is going to be convex. So what is the Legendre transform? This is what Lieb uh, discovered in uh, 83. So first, the first question is, what is uh, the dual variable to V? Well, that's the density of the system. And uh, so let me remind you very quickly that uh, if you have a mixed state gamma, if you diagonalize it in a, in a basis of uh, some pure states, then the density of gamma is just uh, the average of the densities of uh, the wave function of psi j's, which is defined the usual way by integrating n minus one uh, electrons and summing over all speeds. Okay, so that's the density of a state gamma. And then when you compute the energy, you always get the integral of V times this density. So the density is the dual variable to the potential. So the question is, what is the Legendre transform of E and of V? And uh, Lee found that it's the following. So that's the F of rho, which is written here. It's a very simple uh, functional uh, to define at least. And what is it? What you're doing is you take a density, you pick a density profile, okay? So rho is given, that's the density profile of your n-particle system. And then you minimize kinetic plus Coulomb over all possible fermionic uh, quantum states having this density, uh, which by the way, I have forgotten here because I changed at the last minute. So here there is a typo. You have to put uh, the constraint that the rho of gamma is a row. Okay, so let me uh, say it again. So you pick a row and then you minimize kinetic plus Coulomb over all possible quantum states of density row. Okay, and here I'm looking at mixed states. And because we look at mixed states, it's an exercise to see that this F is actually convex. Okay, that's the reason why we look at mixed states because we get a convex functional. And it's also quite easy to see that the en of v, you can, uh, I mean, you can always, uh, instead of minimizing over all gammas, you can first minimize uh, over rho and then at fixed rho, minimize over all gammas having that rho. And you get that en of v is the infimum of f of rho plus integral times rho v. Okay, so this says that en of v is the Legendre transform of f of rho, and since f of rho is convex and e n of v is concave, then f of rho must also be the Legendre transform of e n of v. Okay, so these two functionals are related by uh, some kind of duality. And in principle, you will know everything about the ground state energy of uh, quantum systems in any potential if you know, or if you knew, uh, the universal functional f of rho. So the talk is going to be about this f of rho, this universal f of rho. That means it has no external potential. What you, what you are fixing is the density. So you give yourself a density profile, and then you look at the lowest possible energy. Maybe you, the first question is for which f rho this is well defined. And it's been shown that it's finite, so it's well defined if you like, if and only if uh, the gradient of the square root of rho is a square integrable. Okay, that's what chemists uh, call the Weizsäcker energy, Weizsäcker kinetic energy. Okay, so it's a, it's a kind of, uh, and also a kind of entropy, if you like, of this uh, density rho. Okay, and um, so Hoffman and Hostenhof, they have shown that if uh, gamma has a finite kinetic energy, then uh, the, int the, the integral of the gradient of square root rho square must be finite, and conversely, Ariman and Lieb, they have shown that if you give me any density uh, such that this integral is finite, then I can construct a gamma having this density, which has a finite kinetic energy. And when the capital gamma has a finite kinetic energy, it also has a finite Coulomb energy, and then f of rho is well defined. Okay, so you see, um, although the set of potential is not so easy, at least the set of densities is very clear. It's just uh, positive functions. The integral must be n, and the integral of the gradient of the square root square must be finite. So the goal of the talk is to discuss some properties of this f. 
So F, I mean, we would like to know everything about that. F, it's a very complicated uh, functional. It's very non-local, very complicated. What I will discuss are two kinds of uh, information on F. The first one's universal bounds. So bounds which are known to hold for all densities. And knowing some universal bounds is useful when you try to, uh, uh, to uh, invent uh, some empirical approximations of this F. Of course, the goal in practice is to uh, replace this complicated F by simpler ones, by some approximations. That's the goal of TFT. And then it's very useful to know what are the exact properties of that F. And then the second point, which I will touch upon in my talk, is more in the spirit of uh, model uh, reduction, as uh, for the title of the workshop. So namely, so there are some uh, regimes where this very complicated F simplifies, becomes easier. And I will discuss the local density approximation, which is uh, essentially when the, the density is very flat, then F simplifies. So that's the goal of the talk. But uh, in order to simplify my, my discussion, <coughs> sorry, I will actually introduce uh, two auxiliary functionals, which uh, I also obtain in some limits. So that's yet again another model reduction, if you like. So in, uh, in, in the low and high density limits, then this functional f simplifies, becomes a little bit easier. And we will also study these two uh, limiting functionals. So what are they? So what I do is I take a density rho and I scale it with the parameter lambda. I scale it in a way that the integral stays uh, equal to n, the number of electrons. Okay, So I do lambda cube, rho of lambda x. Okay, And I compute f. And then by a change of variables, of course, I mean, you know that the kinetic energy is like 1 over length squared, and the Coulomb is like 1 over length. So when I do the, the reverse change of variables, I end up optimizing over all gammas with density rho and a lambda squared in front of the kinetic energy and a lambda in front of the Coulomb interaction. So this tells me that if lambda is extremely large and the first term must dominate, and if lambda is very small, then the second term must, must dominate, which are the low and high density limits. Okay, so that's the, the following theorem, which tells you that if lambda goes to zero, f is going to behave like lambda, which is kind of obvious from the first line. And it will converge to uh, just minimizing the Coulomb. OK, so if you like, when uh, lambda goes to 0, it's the same as a semi-classical limit, because the kinetic energy doesn't play any role anymore. And we get a classical problem where we minimize the, the, the n particle Coulomb energy, still under the constraint that the n particle probability density, so classical probability density, has density rho. OK, and this I call f classical of rho because it's a semi-classical limit. And then there is another limit when lambda is very large, and so the energy is going to behave like lambda squared, as I said. And then we will just minimize the kinetic energy. So we will just get a non-interacting system. And we minimize uh, the kinetic over all uh, states uh, gamma of density rho. And when it's just a kinetic, it's a little bit easier. It's non-interacting. So we can express everything in terms of the one particle density matrix, which I call little gamma. So please don't be confused. The capital gamma is the n particle state, mixed state. And the small gamma is the one particle density matrix. And because there are fermions, then I end up with a constraint that gamma is less than one in the sense of operators. And I call T of rho, as is usually done in DFT, the corresponding kinetic energy. OK, so T of rho is just the lowest kinetic energy you can achieve with quantum state, with a quantum states at given rho. And the F classical of rho is the lowest Coulomb energy you can achieve with a classical state of density rho. And they are obtained in two different limits. So the F classical of rho is actually what's called a multi-marginal optimal transport problem, because you, you optimize the cost over probability of n variables, fixing all the marginals of that P. 
And uh, that's uh, what's also called strictly correlated electrons. So why strictly correlated electrons? That's because an optimal P for this problem here, for the, the first uh, problem, will usually be a very singular measure. P is P, okay? So singular measure in the sense that it will live on a very low dimensional manifold, or if you like, that the positions of most of the particles will be completely fixed by the, the positions of just a few uh, of these n particles. So extremely correlated system. Okay, so the the low density limit, uh, in a way, you you see uh, mostly correlation. Uh, the, the, the limit 2i, the second limit, is an easy limit, right? Because the, in the first limit, uh, the, the p is very singular, so it has an infinite kinetic energy, and that's why proving i took some time. So there are several papers, they are cited here. However, the proving 2i is an easy limit because we don't lose any regularity here. Uh, the, the limit uh, is uh, this kinetic energy problem in the sense of regularity, it's the same as the full problem. Okay, so now we have three functionals. We have the, the universal uh, leap functional F. We've got the same for the classical problem. And then we have the kinetic energy. Okay, and because F is just the minimum of a sum and the other two are just the minima of uh, each term separately, it's clear that the F of rho is larger than the T of rho plus the classical F of rho. Okay, so the minimum of a sum is always larger or equal than the sum of the minima. So if we are interested in getting lower bounds on F, then we may as well study separately T and the classical F. Of course, if we want upper bounds, it doesn't work. But for lower bounds, we can just look at the two functional separate. I have to tell you what uh, the local density approximation is. So what is local density approximation? It is the fact that uh, these functionals, the three of them, but I will only uh, describe it for the F, the full one, is going to be local. What does local mean? Local mean that it will only depend on, on the value of the density at a point X, which is then average over all possible positions. Okay, the F cannot be local just because Coulomb is long range. So there will always be a non-local long range term, but it's an easy term. It's the direct term, the Hartree term, the Coulomb term, I don't know how you want to call it, but the classical interaction of uh, the, this uh, charge density row. So this will always be here. It's non-local, but we, we can just subtract it. And then in the local density approximation, the rest is going to be local. So it's going to be an integral over x of a certain function f of rho of x. That's the local density approximation. Here it's an approximation, but uh, the, the, the question is in which regime <coughs> uh, such an approximation will be valid. And it's going to be valid in the case that your density is very flat, of course, because it must be essentially constant, but it must be very flat on very large sets, okay? <clears throat> Just to make sure that this picture here is valid. So the idea is you have this density and locally, you just replace rho by a constant over a small box of volume dx, if you like. And then you replace the energy by the energy of an infinite system, which is a constant and homogeneous over the whole space. Okay, that's LDA. Okay, so locally, you just replace your energy by the energy of an infinite system having uniform density work. Okay. So now I'm going to state the theorems which we, we have proved for the three functionals. And I'm going to start with the kinetic energy, which is a little bit easier. So kinetic energy, let me remind you what it is. So you pick a density rho and you minimize over all quantum states just the kinetic energy fixing the density to be rho. And of course, what's going to be the LDA is what's called the Thomas Fermi energy, which is just a universal constant times integral rho to the 5 third. Okay, kinetic energy is like 1 over n squared, so it can only be rho to the 5 third. And uh, so there are two things I want to tell you. First, universal bounds. Maybe I'll start with the second one. 
So there is a universal lower bound on T of O, and it's called the Lipterian inequality. It was proved in uh, 75. And the best constant, the one I've put here, the 0 0.77 times the Thomas Fermi um, constant um, was proved only very recently last year. Okay, so that's one universal bound on this T of rho. The T of rho is controlled from below by rho to the 5 third. The conjecture is that it is actually controlled from the, exactly the Thomas Fermi. So the, the, this 0 0.77 should not be here. But uh, this is an open problem, and the best that could uh, be proved so far was this 0 0.77. Okay, so that's a universal lower bound on this T of O. That's the, the smallest that the kinetic energy can be if you fix the density. Now I will discuss the local density approximation. So we want to say that if rho is kind of very flat, then it must be exactly equal to the five third, okay? And here we manage to uh, prove an inequality which is valid for all rows, even though it's only interesting for some rows, namely the ones which are very flat. So there is a lower bound. The lower bound was shown by NAM in uh, 2018, okay? And the lower bound involves row five third itself and the Weizsäcker um, term. Okay, so the gradient square root rho square with a crazy one over epsilon to a crazy power. Okay, so that's num lower bound. Of course, proving a lower bound is more complicated than proving upper bound because upper bound, you just construct a trial state yourself. So we managed to prove a better upper bound of the same kind, except so it has a one over epsilon here. Okay, so this bound is valid for all epsilons, but uh, of course it's only interesting, you see, if the Weizsäcker term, the gradient term, is much smaller than rho 5 third. Because if it's much smaller, then I can pick epsilon quite small. If you like, I can, I can actually optimize over epsilon. And then on the right side, I will get something which is negligible compared to the Thomas Fermi term. Okay, so that's really LDA in the sense that it's a bound which is true for all densities, but it's only interesting if the gradient term is much smaller than the Thomas Fermi rho 5 third term. And then all the blue part is going to be some error terms, and then I will be able to get uh, Thomas Fermi uh, as a leading term. So for instance, if you take a row, say, of integral equal to 1, so you take a row for one particle, and then you scale it, but you scale it differently from before. You do rho of n minus a third times x. Okay, so you scale it horizontally, but not vertically. You see what I mean? So the integral of this guy is n. Okay, so you pick a rho and you scale it horizontally. As you can see, it's very slowly varying because the gradient is like one over n to the one third. Okay, so if you take this row, put it in the bounds, and then optimize over epsilon, you will see that in this regime, the leading term is the Thomas Fermi um, term. So if you get n uh, times rho to the 5 third, and then actually num errors, the lower bound is the worst, and it gives an error which is n to the 7 over 8. Okay, this is not at all expected to be optimal, but that's the best which, we could, which could be proved for the moment. I would like to quickly uh, tell you how we prove the upper bound, because for the upper bound, you have to cook up a trial state. And uh, the, I mean, we are happy with this uh, small idea we, we had. It's very simple. I mean, if you think about it, it's clear that it's what you have to do, but we couldn't find it anywhere. So let me explain to you. So let me remind you that if you take the free Fermi C, so you look at the non-interacting uh, Fermi gas, then, uh, I mean, this guy uh, where you truncate, uh, you take uh, this chemical potential here as a row to the two third, exactly has the constant density rho over the whole space, right? So that's a notation uh, to, uh, for the, the projection. I mean, uh, just filling up the kinetic energy up to this Fermi level, okay? In the whole space, everywhere. 
Of course, our density road, I mean, is just as a certain shape. But what we do is we think in the Lebesgue way. Okay, so we think that we have our row, and then we think of this row as a slicing row, but horizontally, Lebesgue way. Okay, you know what I mean? And then what we want to do is in each uh, set where rho is constant, somehow we want to put the Fermi gas of that density localized on the set where rho is equal to that constant. So this we cannot do exactly, but what we can do is to do it almost using some kind of uh, approximation of the delta. So the idea is the following. So you pick a very a nice function eta, the integral of eta is one, and you also need that this integral here is less than one. So if you like your eta leaves quite a bit on the right, uh, uh, I mean, has to leave a little bit on the right of uh, one. Okay. And then you have this obvious uh, relation here, right? Which uh, you deduce just by changing variables. You uh, let t prime be in t over rho. Okay. So you get this obvious relation. And this you should think as a way of decomposing rho horizontally with with a rho of x being almost equal to t if eta is very close to a delta close to one. Okay, and now once you have this decomposition of rho, this gives you the idea of introducing this one particle density matrix here, which is just the Fermi gas here, there it is, Fermi gas. I call t the density of this Fermi gas. Okay, and then I localize because I think that my Fermi gas has a density t, and here is one over t to keep the, the density of the Fermi gas. And then I want to put this Fermi gas where rho is essentially equal to t. So that's why I localize using eta of t over rho of x. Okay, so that's a little bit a crazy operator, but once you think about it, it's kind of natural. It's a natural trial state. The difficulty of a DFT is uh, that you need to construct a state which has exactly the given density rho, and this guy does. So gamma has exactly density rho. It satisfies that it's less than one, so it's a fermionic admissible one particle density matrix. That's because of this condition here. And if you compute its kinetic energy, just do the computation, you will discover that it has a Weizsäcker term and it has a Thomas Fermi term with some constants depending on eta, okay? And now you just play with eta, and you see that if you want b to be very close to one, what you have to do is to concentrate eta close to, to one, exactly as I was saying. So you should think that eta is very close to being a delta close to one, length epsilon, and then you pay uh, in A, and that's the epsilon, let me show you again, the bound here, okay? so this. And then there is a one here, when you put these two terms together, one plus epsilon, if you like. And then the constant of our epsilon is just coming from that A. Okay, so it's a very natural trial state, but it's not so easy to come up with a gamma which has exactly density rho. And that's the way you can prove the upper bound. Okay. So that's all I wanted to tell you about the kinetic energy. So now, now let me go to the Coulomb energy. So I'm only looking at Coulomb alone. Right? I'm not mixing Coulomb and kinetics. So I'm just looking at Coulomb alone. And I start with universal lower bounds. So a universal low, lower bound for Coulomb is what's called the Libox Ford inequality. And we have a new inequality, which we've uh, posted on archive uh, very recently, like two weeks ago, or three maybe, uh, which states that the full Coulomb energy is bounded from below by the direct term and then minus a constant times rho four third. Now it must be rho four third just because Coulomb is one of our length and rho four third is the natural scale. So the Libox Ford inequality is an important inequality. It's actually used. I mean, for some reason, the Lipchian is not uh, so much used because people uh, use rather concham, they have orbitals, and then they, they don't really approximate the T of rho uh, explicitly, but Coulomb, they have to approximate it, and then they are happy to have some universal bounds. So for instance, Libox Ford was used to calibrate some uh, functionals like uh, PBE or SCAN. 
the, the best constant which existed before our work was 1.64, and here we get 1.58, it's a little bit smaller. It's still not equal to the conjecture base constant, which is supposed to be 1.44. Anyway, fighting with constants is a, is a business that uh, mathematicians don't like very much usually, but here, if you want to, to do something of uh, relevance to a, to a quantum chemistry, then one has to give real numbers and not just there exists a constant. So we can prove the bound for all entities with 1.58. And then if rho is constant, there's a better 1.45, which is actually due to Lieb and Lamaupfer way back in 73. Um, when discussing uh, this bound with uh, John Perdue, uh, so uh, John Perdue insisted that we look at exchange and not only the full uh, indirect score, if you like, the full Coulomb energy. So what is the exchange energy? Well, one way to define it is the same as before, except that you restrict to Hartree-Fox states. Okay, if you restrict to Hartree-Fox states, then here you, you have exactly um, identified the direct term, and therefore by doing this bound, you are actually estimating the exchange term. So then we worked a lot to try to get a bound for exchange. And the goal was to get a bound which was lower than the best uh, Lee Boxford constant, which is 1.44. So John Perdue has a conjecture that the constant must be actually 1.09, but we could prove it with 1.25 for our three Fox states. Okay, so this is saying that the exchange term for any R3 Fox state can never be larger than 1.4. 25 times rho for third. And this was not known before with such a small constant. And actually we can even lower it to 1.21 in case rho uh, is constant. Okay. I want to quickly discuss um, this uh, 1.21 because the proof just fits on these uh, five lines here. I'm going to do, do it very fast, but just to give you a vague hint. Actually, our proof does not only hold for all Hartree Fox states, but it holds for all uh, n particle states which have a negative truncated two particle correlation function. Remember, it's purely classical here. We only look at Coulomb. So it seems that the, for, for, for our bound, the the right concept is this uh, negatively correlated state, so namely the ones which have a negative correlated, uh, uh, truncated, sorry, two particle correlation function. And this I've never seen anywhere. So, I mean, this state. So, if you have a, any comment, I would be happy to hear it. Anyway, so the truncated correlation function is just the difference between the usual two point correlation function and rho of s, rho of y. That's the truncated, and we ask that it is negative everywhere. Okay, and then we also ask that rho is constant, meaning it is constant on its support. So, how do you estimate Coulomb minus the direct term? Well, the, the remark is that the full Coulomb minus the direct term is exactly the integral of the truncated two-point function, right? Because it's exactly the diff this, this difference with the one half in front. Okay, so we have to estimate this truncated two-point function in terms of rho to the fourth third. So what we do, we just introduce rho to the fourth third with a sum of a lambda. And uh, then we do the same, oh boy, there's a plus and a one. No, 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 it's correct, sorry. So minus lambda rho fourth third. And then if you compute, uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 the error term, you realize that you can write it this way with another minus. Okay, so that's just an identity. And now here, first bound, you are going to use that the row two is negative. So if the row two is negative, you can just replace this here by a positive part. It will, everything will go down. And once you've used that row two is negative and you have made this replacement of the positive part, now you just estimate row two 
by rho of x, rho of y, which by the way is just rho squared because rho is constant. Okay, so you get minus rho squared over two integrated over omega times omega. And then this term here, and here rho is constant, so you get that term. And then you replace one variable to integrate over the whole space. So you replace omega by R3, and you get an integral which you can compute dy explicitly. And you immediately get rho for third times this number here. And then you optimize over lambda and you get 1.21. Okay, so anyway, so it's an easy proof, but I want to insist that we use that the truncated two point correlation is negative and somehow uh, that's the only thing which is needed to uh, decrease very much uh, the indirect energy in absolute value. So the next step now is to discuss uh, the local density approximation for the Coulomb energy. So here is the general result. So the result is that there is a universal constant E U E G, which is just uh, the energy of the uniform electron gas. So that the classical Coulomb can be approximated by the Hartree term and then go to the fourth third. So here is the local density approximation Okay, with a little f, which is just uh, the, the four third power. As usual, we try to get universal bounds valid for all densities, even if the bound is more interesting for some densities. So the bound is epsilon, and here we we got rho plus rho four third, and here we have a gradient term with again one over epsilon to a huge power bar seven. So again. When rho is very flat over large domains, then the gradient term is going to be much less than the first term. And then by optimizing over epsilon, you will have justified uh, the local density approximation for the Coulomb part. Okay. I want to mention that here I've put an F tilde, because actually this theorem we could only prove for the grand canonical version of uh, the Coulomb energy. For the Coulomb energy, we can only do it for a rescaled rho. So rho of n to the minus a third times x. And then we get n to the 5 third times the direct term, and then rho for third of order n. Okay, so which you would get, by the way, by uh, this inequality, if it is true, we think it is true. But uh, the grand canonical version is much easier to use in this business. Okay, so you see I've discussed the kinetic energy alone, universal bound LDA, then the Coulomb energy alone, universal bound, which was Gibbs form, then LDA. So now we want to put everything together and then the top key is going to be over. So first we have universal bounds as well, just by putting together the previous bounds. So here is an example of what you can get. If you use lip tearing for the kinetic and Libox form for Coulomb, you see that you, you uh, bound the, the, the universal Lib functional by a kind of Thomas Fermi Dirac functional, which has a row 5 third, a row 4 third, and the Dirac term, and some constants. Okay, so not the optimal constant, but some constants. If you want an upper bound, then, then you have to put a Weizsäcker term, otherwise, it's, uh, it's not possible. And the row for third, you don't have to because it's negative, but you can also bring it if you like. Okay, so you have these kind of bounds, universal bounds. And here I'm writing a constant, but we, I mean, we can make this constant explicit. Huh? It's just not so, because it's valid for all epsilon. And now here is a LDA in the full quantum case. So when we look uh, really at uh, the, the full model, so the, the theorem is saying that the f of rho is uh, approximated by a local term, which is f of rho of x dx, this term here, if, of course, you always subtract the direct term. Okay, so the Coulomb term, which itself is non local. So it's LDA and it has several terms. So it has, as usual, epsilon times a local term, and then gradient terms uh, here on the right side. I should emphasize that this bound is 
clearly not optimal. For instance, it's not very natural to have rho and rho square, right? Because of the scaling of the problem, it would be much more natural to, to have rho four third and rho five third, right? Because our problem has a term with one over length squared and one over length. So by putting rho and rho squared, somehow we kind of put a little bit too much information in the problem. Same for the gradient. So although it's very natural to have the Weizsäcker term, the last term is not that natural. It doesn't have the right scaling for the same reason that the first term doesn't have the right scaling. So somehow we, we want to control things too much and we are forced to use more information that, than we should be using. But that's the best that we could prove so far. Okay. So this is the, the first proof actually of LDA for the full uh, quantum problem for electrons any density row, then you have this universal bound and this little f here. What is little f? That's my last slide. Little f is uh, the indirect energy per unit volume of the uniform electron gas, namely a gas at a constant density. So it has this shape. Here I, I plotted a very smooth function, and it's not that smooth, but anyway, so it has this shape, so it behaves like minus rho for third at low density, right? Because at low density, it's a classical problem. And then at large density, uh, the, the leading term is the kinetic energy, so it behaves like Thomas Fermi rho five third and minus the Dirac correction rho four third. Okay, with this constant here written on the right. So I told you that the f uh, is probably not a smooth function, so it's known to be Lipschitz, but it's not going to be smooth. So there, there will be jumps in the derivatives, which correspond to the phase transitions of uh, the uniform electron gas. And I want to emphasize that computing this f is just a function of one variable. Huh? It looks innocent, but it's extremely hard. And in particular, although for many years it was thought that there must be uh, several um, phase transitions, then now it seems to be that there are less phase transitions that were expected in the past. Okay, so let me remind you. So there will be a solid to a, to a fluid phase transition. This is a kind of clear. However, the question is whether there is a transition due to the spin. And uh, before it seemed that uh, there, there's a transition in the fluid part where you go from an um, unpolarized fluid to a polarized fluid before you go to a solid. But uh, now people are not sure anymore that this is the case. There are some recent very precise results where it seems that this transition actually does not happen. Anyway, so just to tell you this innocent F is actually not so well understood and um, Mathematically, there are many open questions. Even for large rho, now this is related to the talk of Benjamin yesterday. Okay, so Benjamin was uh, Benjamin Schlein was discussing uh, uh, this uh, kind of Bogolubov uh, energy for fermions and uh, the gelman bruckner um, correction, which is the log. So here is the log for Coulomb. So it is expected that the next order is rho log rho which is due uh, to, to some singularities and the slow uh, decay of Coulomb. Okay, so in practice, what do uh, chemists and physicists do? I mean, they, they, just, uh, they just come up with some parametrization of this F. Uh, one very famous one is the Perdue wang parametrization, uh, which are based on uh, some of these numerics which I've quoted here. So I have to stop, let me conclude. So, I've told you that there is this universal lib functional f of rho. If you want to know everything about uh, electrons, then um, you may study uh, the ground state energy, or by duality, you may as well study this f of rho. And in density functional theory, people think of approximating this f of rho instead of the e of v. The f of rho is a very complicated, fully non-local functional of the density. But uh, in some cases, we can prove some exact bounds which are valid for all densities. And these bounds are useful in practice. They are used for calibration of empirical functionals. And then there is the model, redu model reduction part. 
that in some regimes, in particular the slowly varying regime where your density is extremely slowly varying over large domains, then everything simplifies, everything becomes local, and you get this universal function little f, which is now a function of one variable. But this little f is not yet fully understood, and uh, there are many open problems. Thank you.